I was born in the southern part of Iran, a city called Abadan. Born in a Muslim family, Shia Muslim family. My grandfather was a Muslim leader, and he had 19 children. And uh, out of 19 children, he had 84 grandchildren. And obviously, he had to choose one to carry the spiritual uh, pattern of the life and the teachings for 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 the next generation. He asked, uh, he, the, he had, uh, obviously there had been some things that, uh, some, some things had happened, some accidents that I should have been killed, but uh, every single time before uh, a danger was coming toward me, I saw the silhouette of a person that, that always was there, and I spoke of it openly to others. And my grandfather took that sign, obviously, that uh, there is the, the spiritual leaders of Islam are of, uh, looking over this, and this boy and uh, protecting him. So he gave me very close attentions and he taught me all the things I knew about Islam. Uh, I joined uh, Hezbollah. Uh, I, I was in that army for about three years. Uh, I was studying Quran extensively then. My grandfather, actually I saw this seed in my heart that I should uh, share Islam with the poor misled Christians, you know, uh, that uh, have gone astray and obviously remind and be a spiritual leader to our family outside Iran. I traveled to Malaysia where I was caught with 30 illegal passports, put in prison, and so I start teaching Islam in, in the jail and uh, telling everybody uh, what they must do, what are their duties toward Allah. And so uh, I did this uh, routine uh, every day. I prayed obviously five times a day. Uh, Shiites do pray three times and they include the 17 rak'ah in, in the, uh, three times. but. Uh, what I did, when it, because I wanted to spend more time with, with God, I did it at five separate times. And then in the end of the evening, I would uh, pray extra prayers. I would have the habit of uh, reading through the Quran cover to cover uh, once every ten days. And I had gained the spiritual power out of Islam. In the Quran, they have the agenda and the, the spiritual beings. And so, uh, speaking to them is not forbidden. In fact, there are stories of talking to them uh, that uh, Prophet Muhammad did. So, I had been able to connect to that spiritual realm and uh, been able to acquire powers out of that. And so I was able to pray for people, especially when people, uh, someone hurt them or someone did something to them. They would come to me and they would ask me to set a prayer and immediately that person would get sick, have an accident, this kind of things, you know. I was able to close my eyes, uh, tell you what a person is doing in another room. And so this had made me more power hungry. And I wanted to gain more power, so I would spend and meditate more in the Quran. And so as I was doing that one night, I, I just uh, was meditating in the verses. And there are, ver uh, there, there are words in the Quran that are repeated continually, uh, repeatedly, but uh, they have no meanings. They are the secrets of Quran. And so when I was meditating on this, a spirit entered the room and uh, it was much more powerful than I could handle or I could, I could overcome. And so I was filled with fear. And so I tried uh, using all the tools Islam had given me. In the name of Allah, I command you to leave, you know. Uh, Satan, I rebuke you, kind of things. And I uh, used all those and nothing uh, was, was helping. At that moment, I, I was totally desperate and I felt like it is choking me, choking the life out of me. And I felt like I'm dying in that cell. And I just cried out to, uh, to the heavens and I said, God in Farsi, Khuda, help me. And immediately I heard a voice, just as clear as you hear my voice today, saying, bring the name of Jesus. 
And I, at that moment, I really seriously did not give it one second of thought. I just was, I feel like um, going back, I was drowning. A man that is drowning, you throw a rope, they would never question you about the color of the rope. And just grab on. And so I did. I said, Jesus, if you are true, show me yourself. And to this day, I have no idea of this to go back. I'm thinking, why did you word it that way? Why didn't you just say, Jesus, help me? I don't know why, but that's the way it came out. And before I was finished with the sentence, everything was back to normal. Now, that was not my conversion. That was the beginning of my confusion. Why would Jesus help a Muslim? Now, I had done everything in my power to be a good Muslim. I had already uh, tried to go and uh, commit myself to, uh, in the way of Allah and be a martyr for him, you know, walking on the mines. And so the government of Iran is, is used to issue the, the people that are uh, fadai or the ones that are willing to, to give themselves, to sacrifice themselves, a special Quran that had the stamp of the government. Uh, I had participated in the executions by hanging, you know. I I had done everything that I thought I must do uh, against the infidels and anything and everything I must do to share Allah with others. Uh, so I, I, I knew that something is wrong and that was not because I doubted Allah or doubted Islam or anything. I fully believed and I didn't know what that is and it just confused me and so I tried to just forget about it you know but that question why would Jesus help a Muslim why would Jesus help a Muslim that would just keep coming at me I believe in Muhammad the last prophet I would think the, in the perfect religion why would Jesus come to help me and so uh, that uh, two weeks period I just got really confused and I said okay I'm going to pray and fast and ask God himself to show me the path obviously I thought at that moment and there are verses and and things taught in the Quran that says uh, the ways of Allah are many and no matter what part and what part of the mountain you climb you always come to the same uh, mountain top and I thought Maybe that is what, what God is, you know, and then, you no, know, maybe it is different for God. Maybe God has a specific way for me, and He wants me to follow that specific way. So I thought, I will never find out unless I ask this question. So I did. I prayed and fasted, and from the bottom of my heart, with all my strength, I asked, God, what is it that you want me to do? What way is it that you want me to follow? And so for two weeks, I sat in one place and I prayed as many hours as I was awake and I fasted as many as hours as I, I was awake and I would just fall asleep literally in that place. I would wake up and I would just pray again and again asking God, what is the way you want me? After two weeks to no avail, I had no answer. And I really got frustrated. I just thought, forget it, you know, what is this? I have no chance of finding out what he wants. I don't even know if God exists. And I have wasted all my life. Uh, I have been afraid all my life, you know, trying to do everything that would please Allah. And now he confuses me. If Allah is all great and he sees the heart, he knew in my heart I love him. And what matters if I call him whatever name I call him, he knows in my heart I love him. And if it does matter to him, I ask him for two weeks, I sat, prayed, and nothing happens. So, you know what, I'm going to go do my own thing. I'm going to go walk my own path. I'm going to do what pleases me. Obviously at that very moment I felt the power of God filled the room. Now in Islam, the greatest sin you can commit and you can never be forgiven for that is doubting God himself, doubting his teachings, doubting his prophet. And I had done that. And in Islam, they teach you that Allah never visits, God never visits human beings. I feel and I know against Islam I have committed the greatest sin that can never be forgiven 
God's presence is in the room and I'm confronted immediately with His holiness. All this is happening simultaneously and I'm uh, confronted with His holiness which